God, I love science. Any decade now. Any decade now, it's That's coming. It. Well, you know, we just uh, got to know. I love <laughs> just it. Just got to know. That's fantastic. That's very cool. Welcome again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast. For anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as I am by trying to assemble IKEA furniture. You guys any good at that? It's really hard, actually, because those little little uh, uh, L wrenches, the little hexagonal things, I, they're, they're always spin and like fly, and sometimes they hit you in the jaw. It, I don't know about that. Because you're putting tension on them, it goes ka-wang, and bing, bounces off your skull, and you're like, and then you have to bring out all your curses, and the kids are around, and you're like, I didn't, you didn't hear I mommy, would, you didn't hear daddy say that, I'm I sorry. I would postulate there are many- Edit that out. There would be many Where's divorces. Nick when we need them? Many divorces that can be related back to assembling IKEA furniture. Yeah. Anyway, and they're I, heavy too, and you drop them on your feet. I didn't know this was going to touch a nerve. All right. Uh, I am Matt Fox, professor of epidemiology and global health, and I am here with Don Thea and Chris Gill from the Department of Global Health. Hey, Matt. And we are here in the Boston University Godly Studio. Uh, hey, so guys, I uh, recently got myself a subscription to the internets. Do you guys belong to the internets? I use the internet on a daily internet? basis. <laughs> the internets, uh, and I'm I'm really enjoying it. Uh, so I got my my dial up modem and I pointed it right at the uh, Earthlink connection. Opened up my <laughs> Netscape Navigator and I pointed it to this website that I found called www.pophealthex.org. Have you heard of this? Yes, I have. I think you're really gonna like it. It's a it's awesome website for... It's about soda. No, it is soda. the Population Health Exchange website. It is Boston University School of Public Health's resource hub for lifelong learning. You can find all kinds of goodies on this website. The kids apparently love it. There's uh, soda, video tips about public beer, health, as well Twizzlers. as this, this new art form called podcasting. I think you're really going to like it. Oh, uh, this you is like a day of the Triffids. <laughs> And as a reminder, if we could ask you all to go ahead and rate us on your Apple podcast or your iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, I don't know about you guys. I'm still struggling a bit when people ask me to to find it. When I search, uh, if I type in free associations, it doesn't come up. It's true. I have trouble um, with that too. And you have to type in population health exchange, which I, I don't know how we sort that out. But uh, clearly, if you're listening, you found us, but let your friends know how to find us. So now, on to the show. So today in our first segment which is our Journal Club segment, we are going to look at a review article that summarized the evidence around whether food labeling can get us to eat less or at least purchase less, let's just say. Uh, In the second part of the podcast, which is our deep dive, we are going to talk about some series of papers in the New England Journal of Medicine, but also in, in, in other journals that have been found to have some errors in them and how those errors were dealt with. And then in our third segment, which is our Amazing and Amusing, we will get into some things that have us rolling on the floor laughing, or Chris will remind us that there are more nouns than verbs in the world, and I will then go and tell my kids that. By a factor of tenfold. Stare at me like I have two heads. So let's get into it. Our uh, segment one. So we are going to talk about, and I don't think we've done this before, a Cochrane review. Have we done a Cochrane review article? I don't article? think so, no. So this is on the effectiveness of food labeling at reducing caloric intake, the study was published by Cochrane Reviews. The first author was Rachel Crockett of the Division of Psychology at the University of Stirling in the Stirling, UK. And it also uh, had uh, another first author, Sarah King, uh, of the Behavior and Health Research Unit of the University of Cambridge. So they were co-first authors, which I think is a topic in and of itself that we should get into sometime. I'm not sure I believe in the co-first authorship. And the study came out uh, in February and was titled Nutrition Labeling for Healthier Food or Non-Alcoholic Drink Purchasing and Consumption. So let me give you some of the headlines. Uh, This didn't get a ton of coverage, but it definitely got some. Like the sleep study, in which there was always stock photos of people sleeping, this one, for some reason, always had stock photos of either burgers or pizza, (laughs) which disappointed me, because what about candy, which I love? Uh, So here are the headlines. Nutritional labeling on menus can reduce caloric intake, says Science Daily. Caloric counts on restaurant menus reduce how much people eat by 12%, study says. That was from the Daily Main. Obesity crisis, colon. Putting nutritional information on menus may cut calorie calorie intake, says the Express. And calorie counts on menus reduce how much diners eat by 12%. Less than you expected, question mark? That was from the Independent. So... 
uh, as you can tell from that, there are some conclusions drawn by these uh, newspaper articles. Uh, we can talk about whether or not they hold up to the scrutiny. But Don, let's start with you. If you can uh, describe the study for us, tell us what they did and what they found. And in particular, tell us how you feel about logic models, oh, which God. this this article <laughs> contains a logic model. Please, we're just going to skip right <laughs> over that logic model. <laughs> It's a visual thing. You know, you can't you can't really do it justice on a I, podcast. Uh, fair enough. Well done. Uh, well ducked. All right. So um, this is a Cochrane review, and we haven't talked about Cochrane reviews. And, and, and the Cochrane Library um, uh, ha- is a repository of databases of, of, of studies, and they have um, done great work in terms of standardizing how groups of studies or meta-analyses should be done and um, in a very systematic way and looking for measures of quality in terms of how they're done and what can be included and what can't be included. And we had a prior podcast on this previously. And and the Cochrane Library is attempting to really take this and, and move it forward. So this is one of those reviews and it's done um, in a very standardized way. Um, And as Matt, as you mentioned, uh, nutritional labeling is thought to be beneficial because the idea is that for behavior change, if you inform a consumer what's in the food and you can delineate whether it's good or it's bad, whether it's high calorie or low calorie, whether it's healthful or not healthful, that gives them at least a a, a chance of being able to alter their diet so that what they're consuming or purchasing and consuming um, is more healthful. Now, nutritional labeling has been around since about 1990. Um, many, most countries in the developed world do it more or less. Um, and it's becoming a little bit, it's becoming more and more prevalent. And more recently it's become more prevalent on menus. Um, but it's also seen in vending machines and it's seen in grocery stores and certainly on the individual items that we purchase in the, in the grocery store. So, um, there've been, um, quite a number of studies and the authors tried to sort of go through the, the, the existing literature and pull out those articles that they thought were, at least on the surface, of, of reasonably high quality, randomized controlled trials or quasi-randomized controlled trials or interrupted time series, and then um, really pull from that um, search through the literature the, the best examples and then drill down into those examples in a, in a very systematic way and try to answer the question, in fact, do does the presence of these labels on a menu or on a on a, a, a um, an item in the grocery store lead to changes in behavior? I.e., either um, what we purchase or what we consume in the setting of a grocery uh, in the setting of a cafeteria or a fast food store or a restaurant or a vending machine or a vending machine. Um, so they, they went through a systematic dive through, through the literature. They, as I said, collected the RCTs and quasi-RCTs. They excluded pre- and post-intervention studies. Each study had to have at least two intervention sites and two control sites, um, studies that included grocery stores and other food stores, vending machines, cafeterias, and as I said, fast food and non-fast food restaurants. Um, and the labeling characteristics that had to be mentioned of the food that was being tested had to have the type of nutrient, the amount of nutrient, and the label had to be visible either on the menu or on the package insert or the package label. They looked for objectively measured outcomes, um, the either uh, outcomes of food purchases, things that they could measure when people went into the grocery store, or food consumed either in a real-world restaurant setting or in a, what they call laboratory setting, where they would, they would set up um, sort of simulations of the real world and they'd give people food and they would know how many calories and what the composition was beforehand. And they informed them or not of what that was. And then they would count the amount of food that was consumed by counting what was left over and then subtracting it. Um, so those outcomes had to be, you know, had to be objective. Um, they also uh, went through a formal risk of bias and graded the quality of the studies. And as an example of the kinds of questions that were asked to assess the bias in the individual studies were things like, was the allocation sequence randomly generated using an appropriate method for selection bias? Was allocation adequately concealed? Selection bias again. Was, uh, were incomplete outcome data adequately addressed attrition bias? So those are the examples of what the researchers would ask themselves as they were evaluating each one of these individual papers that went into this overall analysis. And so 
they went through the literature. They came up with um, – went down to about 263 papers from which they, um, they abstracted 28 studies, 17 RCTs, 16 of which were individualized RCTs, five quasi-RCTs, and six, in, six interrupted time series. They were all from high-income countries. 21 of them were from the United States. 11 were in real-world settings, i.e. in a restaurant or in a grocery store. Um, 17 took place in labs, which were kind of artificial um, settings. Um, there were 11 purchasing studies, and there were 17 consumption studies. We should probably just explain what that means. Yeah, so the purchasing studies were, was the, was the, the outcome was the purchasing of food. So mm-hmm. were, were the presence of labels or not labels in a grocery store or on a vending, on the food that you could see through the window in the vending machine, present or not, and it, did that affect um, the quality of the food that was purchased? So was it of higher health quality or lower health quality? And each study defined that a little bit differently, and I don't want to get into that because that mm-hmm. gets into the weeds. Yep. But it was really, was there a beneficial effect of knowing, uh, ben- beneficial effect in terms of what you purchased and knowing what it was that you were purchasing, or at least the, the, the nutritive um, content. And then they did the same thing, as I said, in laboratory studies. Um, so really the bottom line is that um, they found that many of these studies, when they went through the fairly specific and intense scrutiny of quality and bias, that very few of these studies were, none of these studies were high quality. Most of them were um, low quality or very low quality. Um, According to the Cochrane definitions. Correct. Which I, we can dispute. But, Cor- yeah, yep. correct. And, and really the only, the only conclusion that gave them any degree of confidence was the one that was referred to in some of those, some of those uh, articles. Number where nutrition labeling on restaurant menus reduced the amount of energy, i.e. calories, by 47 kilocalories in a particular meal. Um, and, and that was where these, these numbers came mm-hmm. from in terms of the effect on what was actually consumed. Um, the, the three studies that all looked at that were um, considered to be of low quality. So the confidence, the authors state that the confidence in that finding was low, but that was really the best of the bunch. Yep. When they looked at the lab studies, they, they didn't really find that any of the lab studies were um, done at a rigorous enough level to, to give people um, much of any conclusions. Um, and that, that's kind of the bottom line. I mean, it, it wasn't an earth-shattering finding, and it wasn't a, a finding that, in my read, gave me a high level of confidence in terms of um, believing the rigorousness of this particular relationship between mm-hmm. knowing what's good for you based on what it is you're about to buy or eat, and you're acting on that by yep. not buying it or not eating it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Chris, what's your what's your take on this one? Yeah, wow. So, um, I'm totally with you, Don. I was for me the biggest revelation was how little we know. I mean, because of the ubiquity of food labeling on everything, um, and one would assume that behind that is an immense sort of juggernaut of science showing that this is going to work. But what what it seems to be saying is that. We basically the science is not there. We don't really know whether it works beyond the rather trivial finding that perhaps it reduces your, you know, choice at a restaurant by eight percent. Like, you know, what is that? Like one less dollop of sour cream on your burrito. I mean, what what does that really mean in the big picture? I have no, I have no idea. I have no idea. I and mean, and this is so so many steps away from saying this is of benefit to an individual, let alone a population. It, it, we are just... Uh, say, say why it's so many steps away. I agree with you. Because in order, I mean, one would assume that if, in order for a, a for an intervention like this to matter, the effect would need to be sustained um, over m- not just the meal that you take at the restaurant, but this is an actual behavior that affects all aspects of your eating lifestyle and is sustained over decades. And that is a long way away from saying you reduced your meal calories by 47 kilocalories. Um, as if we even know that that is a good thing. Is it a good thing? 
Uh, I mean, we don't know. I don't know the answer. To I that. have no idea. What consuming fewer kilocalories? Yeah, it, it, it that is, is a good thing. It, 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 it might be, but it, it you know, I mean, if if we want to get really reductionist about us, we should go back and acknowledge that this concept of a calorie is a very woolly concept when it comes to health, right? I mean, the way you measure a calorie is you you burn different foods and you see how much energy is released and it and you see how many degrees of temperature rise you get in a standardized body of water. And so you burn a peanut or you burn some sour cream or you burn a potato chip and you know or or a piece of fish, right? And so but the fact that those release different amounts of energy does not tell you what your body is going to do with them because your body is not a calorimeter. It does not just you know, turn energy in a one-to-one fashion into heat the way it does when you're burning things. Yep. I and mean, that is just preposterous. And we know that this is this cannot possibly be true. So changing the calories matters less, I think, than what is the composition of the calories. And this is what we've been arguing about with all these meta-analyses this year, is, is that it is way more complicated than just how much you eat. It is what you eat. I agree. And even that is really complicated. So all of these things, when you sort of like say, okay, here's a food label that says this bag of potato chips provides... 10% of your daily recommended allowance of fat, you're like, does that mean I can eat 10 bags of potato chips? What does that mean? I, I mean, yes. what does that mean? I assume. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm bummed that, my ten, that I'm only eating 10% of my daily allowance of potato <laughs> chips. I should obviously be eating more. I, I mean, it, the, the, it, the, what is, so what is the average consumer to do? On the one hand, you could say, yes, Knowledge is good. People are making informed choices. They have data. They can make decisions based on those data. On the other hand, it assumes that we actually know what to do with those data. And the more we have studied these dietary studies, the less convinced I am that we really know what is the right answer, what yeah. we should be recommending. So is this information that that allows people to feel like they're making informed choices? But in fact, we're not really making informed choices because we have no idea what the right answer is anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it, is, it is so baffling to me how, how we are where we are. So, so before I, I get into my take, can I just ask you both, is, do you consider this to be essentially a null finding or is it no finding? Um, and I think I say it's that, more of a no finding rather than a null. Why, why, why do you say that? Well, because I think most of what they're saying is most of these studies were just of such poor quality. And we, what we started That's with their take 200, and 40 studies or study yeah. that they started with and they got it down to 22 or 20, 28. 28, 28 trials. Or so you one wonders what happened to the, the other 28 two. studies, 17 RCTs. Uh, what happened to the other 200? Were they just of so little No, no, quality? they didn't meet the, the inclusion criteria. Okay. They, they, they didn't have the outcome or... Weren't RCTs. But most of these they were not yielded on. results that were, according to the Cochrane reviewers, almost uninterpretable. Yeah, I so this is part of where I, I part of why I wanted to talk about this is I don't agree with the Cochrane's approach to assessing bias. It the bar seems is too high. What's that? You're saying the bar is too high? The bar is incredibly high. And I think, you know, maybe when we talk about drug trials, maybe we want to set the bar really high. Maybe we want to say we're going to have an incredibly high threshold before we say something is good because the consequences are potentially really good or bad, I suppose. I don't could be either. Whereas with certain things, so we've done a lot of reviews of um, studies that look at uh, interventions to reduce dropout from HIV care. And we constantly get the pushback of you need to use the Cochrane approach to assessing the bias in the studies. Well, by the Cochrane's assessment, every single study becomes very bad because there aren't a lot of randomized, nobody's doing a lot of randomized trials of these things. All we have is observational studies. So you start off in the second Mm -hmm. lowest rung Mm -hmm. out of the four categories and you can only, or, or, or maybe start at the bottom and you can move up one. I don't remember exactly. And I'm just not sure for things like this, for which the, the, the risk is probably really low that we want to think of. I mean, I know that risk and bias are two separate things, but that we want to set the bar so high when it comes to what we'll accept as, as good quality evidence. I'm not saying that it, it necessarily, you know, becomes good evidence just because what we're studying might be lower risk. But I am saying that if it's an RCT, okay, it wasn't fully blinded because it's really damn hard to blind something, someone as to whether or not they saw a menu mm-hmm. with calorie information. 
you know, these are all going to sort of fall down the rung. Or and what, I'm not sure that that makes them poor quality. Or what their preconceived notions were you know, before they sat down at the table, knowing that a cheeseburger is necessarily something that's really bad and a salad is not quite yeah. as bad. Yeah, but, yeah. but in addition to that, I, I, don't, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Matt, and I, and I don't necessarily, I mean, I, I don't necessarily disagree. Um, I think it's good to have standards of quality and mm-hmm. it's good to measure against no, those no, standards of quality. I certainly but agree. I think that the, 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 my main takeaway was that that essentially all 28 studies, except for the ones that reported this difference in kilocalorie intake, were inconclusive. So in addition to being low quality... Inconclusive or no? Or are you saying... Well, you- I guess, I guess uh, you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't dive into each one individually, so I can't say each one individually, but I guess my overall thought was that they were null. No, I mean I think more or less. I mean there there there's some variation around that when they meta analyze that they come to maybe there's a small amount, a uh, small effect. But to me that's not that's that's a finding. That's an important finding. If we truly believe there's little going on here, that's that's important because we put a lot of effort and energy and value into these mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in fact, it may be that they're not actually doing what we intend them to do. That's to me that's not um, that's that's it's a not negative a, finding. An, an important negative finding. Yeah. I mean, it would essentially tell us if we believe that. Throw out the labels. Yeah, or that we need to try something new because this isn't getting... I mean, I, there's clearly no harm, mm-hmm. and therefore you don't have to throw it out, but it, we shouldn't be looking to this as our, our way of trying to get people to reduce their caloric intake. But let me tell you guys, because I, 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 I know you guys are both skeptical on this one. The reason why I like this is that... It seems to me that what we have struggled with on this podcast for so long with all of these studies of diet is that all of these dietary studies, or or most of them, at least the ones, all the ones we looked at, look at a particular nutrient or a particular factor in, in terms of diet and try to get at, is this good or is this bad? As if it's a yes or no question and it's a one off thing. And that is so incredibly hard to study, both because those are actually, it's a longitudinal lifetime. Uh, intervention and the behavior is by definition going to vary. No one's going to eat carbs all the time, all every day, but because behaviors are so difficult to entang- disentangle because you eat carbs, you also, you know, consume alcohol or you consume alcohol, you also smoke, whatever it is, these things go together and disentangling them is a nightmare. And I'm not sure that we, and it's not that we don't want to know the answer to those questions. We do, but it's so hard to do that it seems to me as public health professionals, when you put that hat on, that we are are better off thinking about not what, which, which nutrient is it or which particular aspect of the diet is, so much as the real question should be is what do we do about it? If we think that there is some goal we want people to get towards in terms of their eating, what are the interventions that are going to get us there? And those are the questions that theoretically can be answered. It's very hard to do, right? It's very hard to get to people to change their behavior. But that's different from saying it's very hard to study. I think what we learn from studies like this is it, it doesn't do very much. And that's an interesting finding around something that we can actually do around diet. Mm-hmm. Presupposing that, that, that the quality of these studies mm-hmm. was sufficient to be able to come to that conclusion. Absolutely. Which, which is open to debate. A hundred percent. Yeah, I'm not trying to argue these are these are phenomenal studies, but I think they're better than the quality that that the Cochrane Review gives them, because I think the Cochrane Review sets most studies up to be of poor quality unless they are drug trial drug trial studies. I think that's where the Cochrane Review criteria are really set up mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to 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 be useful. the 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 second issue that I I, I want to bring up is that. Um, I find it fascinating because I, I think this is a question that you can actually answer. On the other hand, I also think that answering a question like this, this isn't really a question that should be answered with a Cochrane review because by definition, interventions like this are always going to vary in their effect, even if they have an effect across so many different factors. So who's in the study? You know, what are their dietary habits when they started the study? What's the, you know, what culture are we doing in this? Um, what are their, you know, how educated are they around, you know, particular diets? Are we doing this in, in a, a grocery store or in a restaurant or at a vending machine? Those are all presumably going to differ. Are, am I interacting with another human when I buy this product or am I, you know, going to a machine and pulling it out? It's going to change the way any intervention is going to work because these are behavioral interventions. This is not a take a drug or don't take a drug. Mm-hmm. 
And so I'm just, I, I, I'm not sure that we would ever think that there would be such thing as the effect of food labeling. So these mm -hmm. nutritional studies are a real conundrum. They're I mean, really it, difficult. It, it's really hard to come to any, to uh, even think about how you would set up a, a really high quality nutritional study. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I think you can pick firm outcomes. I don't think that's as much of a problem, but but it's it's really looking at what is the intervention yeah. you know what right. and, and how long do we measure it and how do we do it in the context so of the the human variability of 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 food intake and and even in the acute like this this restaurant study where you know the net effect was to reduce yep. the, the total caloric intake by about 50 kilocalories out of a 600 kilo, kilocalorie meal so what did they do instead you know did you go from you know, a Caesar right. salad with 600 kilograms with lots of anchovies and olive oil and nuts on it to 550 kilograms, uh, kilocalories of cotton oh, candy. Ice cream. You know, what did you eat instead? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it is a... Or, or, or did you save those calories and then go out afterwards for ice cream? Do which double, is what I would have done. Hot fudge on your, your, your Ben and Jerry's. I yeah. Mean, exactly. What, what, what are we really looking at? Well, in addition to which we don't know, I mean, are there any... I mean, this seems to be the kind of thing where the effects could be transitory, even if there are effects that you... You're, you're sort of, okay, I'm, you know, it's new and it's interesting. Okay, I'm going to change my behavior. But actually, after a while, you know what? I actually really want the... the yeah, the, I'm still hungry. The, the extra dollar <laughs> <laughs> sour cream on my burrito, as you say. Burrito grande. A burrito grande. Um, can I ask you a question? Did it bother you that uh, so many of these studies were done in university students and staff? Because they're hungry. <laughs> we'll work for food. You, you know they will always eat. <laughs> Food study. I just wonder, you know, how, how generalized was <laughs> well, you Free put, pizza afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we get our students to come to class. It absolutely is. Beer for the seniors. Okay, so let me just end this then. Well, I'm going to end with two things, but let me end it. So do, do you buy the conclusion then? Because what they say was, findings from a small body of low-quality evidence suggested that nutritional labeling, labeling comprising energy information on menus may reduce energy purchases in restaurants accordingly, and in the absence of observed harms, we tentatively suggest, there's a lot of qualifiers in here, that nutritional labeling on menus in restaurants could be used as part of a wider measure to tackle obesity. Is that justified? I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't buy it, and I'm not going to consume it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure it is. I, I, I thought it was a well- well-run, well-conducted meta-analysis. I thought it was done well. I thought the review was done well. I thought they followed their, you know, everything. To, but I didn't, I did not agree with the, um, with the conclusion. Mm. Okay. Let me I, end. I thought maybe if we had read the 100-page appendix, we, it would have become completely clear. There was... Don was not pleased with the length of the study, let's just say. Well, let's just... Pages. It was 138 pages, but most of it was the appendix details. Let's just admit that Cochrane reviews tend to be... Lengthy. Chatty. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here's the thing that I want to use as our transition to segment two, which is there were three studies in this meta-analysis, in this systematic review, by first author Brian Wansinks. Ooh. Brian Wansinks, I think is how you pronounce his name. Huh. Have you heard this name? No. Okay. So again, only because I follow the psychology literature on Twitter, I am aware of this name. Because starting in January or so of 2017, so this, this came out in the middle of 2017. Starting in January of 2017, uh, there were a group of researchers, um, Jordan, Anaya, Nick Brown, James Heathers, who's here at uh, Northeastern, Tim Vanderzee, who started to have some concerns about uh, his research. So he was a professor at Cornell, has this food lab uh, in which he was getting all these really interesting findings about behavior around food consumption. Um, and they started to notice some things that looked funny. Um, they looked at uh, four of the, the four or five papers and found the conclusions were not supported by the data. They found a total of 150 questionable numbers within his papers, um, impossible values, uh, incorrect p-values, and things like that. These are papers that were reported in the Cochrane Review? No. This is different. Papers by an, one of the authors. As far as I can tell, these papers didn't actually end up in this review, uh -huh. but it's the same author, which makes me question what's going on. 
They wrote to him, couldn't get access to the data. Um, in response, there was a lengthy uh, review of his work. Uh, as of, so this is, I'm reading now from the Wikipedia page. As of March of 2018, seven papers had been retracted. 15 corrections had been issued. Uh, there was somehow, I don't totally understand how they got access to uh, emails which in which they were discussing ways to essentially, I, I don't want to say cook the data, but, but cook the analysis to get interesting findings. Um, really sort of questionable research practices, including, and this is the one I found most fascinating of all, a retraction of a paper that they then fixed, republished, and then had to re-re-retract, which I had never heard of that happening really? before. Really? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, my point is here. In our segment two, we are wanted to talk about a scenario that came up in which there were uh, a, there was a researcher who came up with a statistical technique to sort of probe the findings of randomization in randomized trials to look for findings that seemed odd in terms of the randomization that were different from what you would expect based on what we see in populations, which led to identification of a series of randomized trials that may have had problems, uh, much like the, the, the Wensing set of, of articles. Um, Chris, I'm going to hand it over to you at this point. If you can sort of describe to us the, the scenario and what happened, uh, and then we can get into what we think uh, should be done about this. Sure. So th this was a, um, the study in question was a paper published in 2013. Um, and the author, the lead author was uh, R. Estruk. And this was a dietary study that was done in Spain, um, testing the impact of the Mediterranean diet on cardiovascular outcomes and mortality. And this was a very large study of around uh, just shy of 8,000 individuals who were randomized equally to uh, one of two permutations of the Mediterranean diet, one which was enriched with olive oil, for which they were received donations of olive oil so they could have the olive oil, all the olive oil that the diet required, or a Mediterranean diet that was enriched with nuts and they were given lots of nuts so they could have as much nuts as they needed to have in their diet, or a control diet, which was where they just received advice to reduce the amount of fat in their diet. And the study uh, was published in 2013 and showed about a 40, 50% reduction in cardiovascular uh, events. And so this was quite a big deal and seemed to be very strong evidence for the Mediterranean diet. Now, this then got flagged by um, Carlyle's analysis. Because yeah, and I should say, Car so, so John Carlyle c came up with this methodology to look for these non-random uh, what looked like non-random patterns in randomization sequences or, or the baseline tables in randomized trials. Uh, and he ran this, you know, across a whole bunch of randomized trials in high-impact journals and identified, a, I can't remember how many, but a certain number that, that sort of met a very high bar for potentially being non-random. This was one of them. This was one of the studies that got flagged. Right. Um, and so it eventually led to an internal audit, and they they realized that that Carlyle was was correct, that they had they made... They being the authors, realized. They the authors, yes, that Carlyle was, was correct and that they had made some mistakes. This was not uh, with nefarious intent, but it appeared that at um, one of the research sites, of which there were many research sites, that the local investigator who was enrolling the patients was not actually randomizing individually, but rather if there was a husband and wife pair living in the same house... He would assign them to the same diet, reasoning that it would be very difficult for them to have different diets since they're husband and wife and they're sharing all their meals. And so that is obviously not random because what the, the one individual gets, the other one individual gets. Okay, And then similarly, there was a, a another research site where they randomized at the level of, of – um, Villages, I believe it yes. was. Uh, and so everyone in the village would get the same diet. And 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 so both of these would be not quite random. Um, had these been stated in the methods, I don't think anyone would have blinked because that's, that seems to be a very reasonable thing to do. And yet it was not as described in the paper. So the authors responded to this by going back and 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 uh, you know aggressively trying to to address this 
uh, mistake. I think they were very, um, uh, you know, upset and uh, probably appalled by what had happened. And but I don't think they meant to do this. It was certainly not a willful misrepresentation of of their results. And so they re-ran the analysis, adjusting for these non-random pairings. And drumroll came up with almost exactly the same results as before, which was then republished, along with a long set of appendices to the the, the, the main analysis explaining how they had ad- ad- addressed these issues from multiple sensitivity analyses positions. And um, I think you, you're probably going to mention this and talk about more, um, the use of, of quantitative bias analysis. Um, so it was sort of an interesting exercise in, in kind of going through, yes, technically, Carlisle was absolutely right. There had been some uh, errors in the randomization process, but these errors, in fact, didn't really change the the conclusions of the trial. So there, there's a sort of, a, I, I guess, somewhat of a happy ending here. There is for this particular trial, and I think the the the, the point that I want to make is that this 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 methodology flagged a number of trials, some of which you know identified other kinds of mistakes. So things didn't look the way they should have because the study was reporting either the standard error when they should have been reporting the standard, standard deviation or vice versa, or they just mislabeled it, things like that, stuff that, that, that would sort of explain why things differed from the expectation. I think that the, what this sort of flags for me is that um, technology is progressing to the point at which it is easier and easier to detect these kinds of things. Um, and to uh, the technology, is, as we've seen in many of the, the kinds of um, weird and wacky stuff that we've looked at in the, on the podcast, to be able to extract information from large bodies of research uh, uh, autom- in an automated fashion such that you can then develop these databases to look for these things, that we are getting closer and closer to the, the scenario where these things could sort of be automated and detected in real time almost. And the question becomes, what is the um, what's the lesson here? I mean, or, or, or is there are we worried about fraud or are we worried about the honest mistake? And mm-hmm. if well, you make an honest mistake, what do you do about it? Yeah, well, I, I guess the answer is, is is both because Carlisle's initial hunt was triggered by this concern about a series of papers by a, a researcher called Yoshitaka Fuji who had written well over a hundred articles um, and. Uh, Carlisle had spotted one of these papers where he thought that the the standard devi- deviations or standard errors in the baseline table one could not have been generated by by random chance given the sample size, and he basically said, "This is fabricated. There's no other way to to create this." Uh, this pattern. And so he wrote this as a letter to the editor, to the journal where Fuji, uh, Fuji's paper has been published, and the journal said, go prove it. So he came back with, with a pretty heavy-hitting statistical analysis, putting some um, sharp accusations, not at the, the primary, art, just the primary article, but in fact, the oeuvre of Fuji Taki, uh, uh, Yoshitaka Fuji's work, mm-hmm. um, which he is now, I, I think, the 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 leader for having retracted papers been retracted uh, in history um, because it seems like this this was not a one off unfortunately for poor Dr Fuji I think I, so, I think you're right so so the so Don you and I have been in this scenario ourselves not mm-hmm. of having a paper retracted but of as we talked about in the No Shot study of doing a randomized trial where things didn't work out. And if you remember correctly as we as we talked about we 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 didn't initially uh, address it other than through discussion. Mm-hmm. We didn't sort of do anything about it. We just sort of noted it, said, you know, uh, what, and then we never, you know, looked into it, never found out exactly why it happened. But these things do happen, right? See, to me, our experience, I think, is the system working. And this experience, yeah. the system was not working. Yeah, and, and, and I think that uh, that part of why... You say that because it was picked up? Because it was picked up because the, the, the paper, which was published in The Lancet, had five reviewers, one of which was a statistical reviewer. And I find that that is less and less... Common. I don't know what your experience as, no, as an editor be. is, but but I think yep. that you know I think that there's fraud, which ho- hopefully is minimal. But I think that there's sloppiness. Yep. There's also lack of adequate statistical oversight, so that so that reviewers can catch honest mistakes or honest. Um, um, you know, inattention to detail, not that that was the situation in our, in our case, but there was a finding that we tried to explain a way that needed a quantitative bias analysis, which is what you did, which 
satisfy the statistical reviewer and and made him made him and all the reviewers realize that even though there were flaws, even though there were there were warts in, in terms of randomization for our study, when you did all the sensitivity analysis, you, you, you we were able to convince reviewers that it, it didn't matter that our findings were still robust mm-hmm. to those inconsistencies. Mm-hmm. So does it change your view of the Mediterranean diet study that it had this flaw that's now been fixed, but it, 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 it could, I mean, it could only be fixed in the sense of analytically, not in terms <laughs> of, of the design. Well, it's funny, funny you should ask because it's to, to my mind, the, the biggest, uh, you know, my biggest question mark about the Mediterranean diet study was really what's going on with the controls. Um, mm-hmm. you know, you, you know, in, in, in theory, the control diet should be neutral, but what if the control diet is actually harmful? Like, you know, they're saying, you know, eat low fat. So does that mean eat more potato chips? So what exactly did they go do? to the potato chips. Well, don't I you? love potato chips. Who doesn't? Um, Doritos too are fat. very fine. Um, they're all fat almost. Uh, well, maybe we should go with fat free. Those are delicious. <laughs> fat free potato chips oh. fat free are so, a waste of time. So uh, good. It's like prime against nature. Beer. It's, it's up there. It's uh, like... Cardboard. It's like yeah, eating card, yeah, salted it's cardboard. Really tasty. Mm. Yeah, we're all we're all into them. Um, but I, you know, I think that that's the question. So you know, the two permutations of the Mediterranean diet performed about equally. Uh, you know, in their in their in their revised and original results. Um, but really, is this because it the Mediterranean diet was helping them reducing risk, or because the control diet was increasing risk? You know, you, you you do wonder, like, what 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 did we actually learn here from this? You're saying you'd want a control group that was just nothing. I, I guess so. I just I, said, you know, leave leave them leave them to their own devices yeah. because even because you know, a couple episodes ago we did a meta analysis looking at changing diets based on yeah, yeah. total fat versus carbs. And there mm-hmm. was the high protein, high carb, high fat diet. And I think everyone is assuming that the high fat diet would, would like turn out to be associated with increased mortality, but it was exactly the opposite. And so could they have done the same thing here, assuming that high fat is bad? And in fact, maybe high fat is... Well, that's essentially the Atkins diet. Right, right. It, that's right. Yeah, which has actually stood up. Which gets back to our, our repeating refrain is that we, we, it is really hard to has know it? what's the right thing to do. Kind of. Really? Yeah. yeah. Bacon, so. does, this is the bacon diet? No, it's a bacon diet. Bacon yeah. with donuts? Yeah. <laughs> no, donuts have carbohydrates. So it's oh, a, donuts so are it's bad. bacon, it's <laughs> eggs, it's shoot. steak, it's, you know. Yeah, shoot. Uh, that's okay. a whole yeah, other dis- say... discussion. All right, like so, so, so let me end this with, with just one question. So... The review that, that Carlisle did, if I understood correctly, he included, uh, he looked at more than 5,000 trials, 934 of which were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. He flagged 11, 11 of 934. Wow, that's impressive. Is it? That was kind of my question. That's pretty low, in other words. Well, that's my question. Is it, is that, does that fit with your prior, what, if I would have asked you, well, it's how, many, how many trials do you think contain this specific type of error? where there's just something funky about the randomization, either it was screwed up intentionally or, or it was screwed up by accident. Yeah, I would say pretty low. So, I think 11 is pretty low. I'm, so I'm saying, do, does that fit I, I, with what I you would have thought? I would have thought it would be pretty low, too. You would have thought it would be low. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so does that suggest to you that this is overblown? That, that there were a future, in other words, does it suggest to you that, that what this, uh, what Carlisle discovered was there are a few trials that have some problems, but generally speaking, in terms of this particular issue, actually, usually things are going okay. But again, but you know, I, I think, I think, fix I think it's, it's, it's analogous to what I was just talking about with the Lancet and our experience with the New England Journal. They very often where appropriate have a statistical reviewer. And I would guess that the same thing operated in those particular studies where if there was a problem, it was identified before publication. So the number of papers that got published with a particular randomization problem is minimized because the system worked. Yep. Right. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And with the with the Fuji paper, it was, you know, he, he followed the smoke to the fire. There was plenty of context around that to raise suspicions already. And it wasn't that Fuji, you know, that Carlisle was the first to, to question Fuji's results. Mm-hmm. So I think that, 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 you know, once you go out of that extreme deviation from the norm back to the norm, you're finding that, you know, researchers are generally a pretty ethical bunch who try to do the right thing. And clinical researchers are hard and sometimes they screw up. But it's, it's rarely, rarely fraud. Uh, Okay, so last point, and that's specific to this particular study, the, the Mediterranean diet study. So the, the, this uh, came from an article in, in NPR, a story in NPR, I think, that we were looking at, 
that um, was talking about this, and they they talked to the researchers, and and this this is a quote from the NPR article. It says, "Still, because everybody wasn't randomly assigned to different groups, the study can no longer <laughs> claim the diet directly caused those health benefits." Quote: We need to tone down the results. But it is just a little bit, he says, and I think he was one of the authors. Yeah, I didn't understand that at all. Do you? Do you? Do you? I mean, that's what I was going to get. At. I, I mean, is that, is that at all? I I, I disagreed with that. Yeah, I disagreed with that, that too. That I mean, I think what we basically said was there were some mistakes. But if you remove those mistakes, the findings still generally hold up. Maybe you have some increased skepticism right. uh, overall, but right. generally speaking, it, it doesn't change it to me. It was from like it, it was, was causal. causal. It was causal before, and and then it wasn't. Yeah, yeah because I just said, the study had a few little warts, yeah. except for the bit potato chip bias. <laughs> and again, I just want to hammer this point home. This gets to my point that a randomized trial with some flaws is treated much more harshly than a, a really big observational study. That has all kinds of, of warts in it and, you know, just sort of gets a break because we know it's an observational study. So it's just not fair. Yeah. Amen. Life is tough for, for randomized trials. All right. Well, let us, let us move on to our last segment, which is our Amazing and Amusing, where we want to highlight some of the things that cause us to roll on the floor laughing or totally inspire us. Chris, you want to you wanna go first? Yeah, I'm going to talk about biomass. Okay. Go for it. So biomass is the total, the sum total of stuff that is alive on the planet. The sum total of all. Okay. So, okay. And, and um, we're not talking about the numbers of organisms. We're talking about gigatons of carbon that has been incorporated into life forms. Gigatons? Live life forms or live, dead, dead live, life forms? Like life leaves forms. on the ground are like included? Live Life forms, like a tree would have a lot of living life carbon forms. in it, right? Living life forms. So what they're trying to do is to, th this paper, uh, which is, hold on, let me give the name. How much aliveness called, is the, there in the universe? It's called uh, the, the Biomass Earth. Distribution on Earth, the Biomass Earth. Distribution on Earth by Yinan Baron, Rob Phillips, and Ron Milo published in the Proceedings of the National Academies very recently. And they wanted to sort of do a, a, a planet-wide census of all the stuff that's alive on the planet, how much of it there is and what kinds there are. And, and it, this is very, very cool. And they One looked at hell of several, a spreadsheet. several <laughs> hundred <laughs> articles to do this. And it also leveraged all sorts of this, new technologies uh, in terms of being able to measure things through microbiomics and different measurement tools that did not exist a decade ago. And so um, that's what they did. And I'm just going to give you the high-level summary of what they found which is really interesting. So the total biomass on the planet Earth is 550 gigatons, and each gigaton is 1 billion tons. Okay, so 550... So if I had a gigaton in my hand, I would need five of them? <laughs> 550 of them. I don't know. Yes, so it's a, lot a, of, a lot of tons of carbon out there. Now, of those 550 gigatons... Plants, terrestrial plants largely, account for 450 out of the 550 gigatons. Insects. They are way down on the list, but I'm getting there. You Bacteria the count for 70 gigatons. Fungi, mushrooms and yeasts and things like that, 12 gigatons. Archaea, which is a bacterial family that is in between the old bacteria and eukaryotes, which are like mammalian cells um, or, you know, animal cells. Um were seven gigatons. Protists, which are like uh, paramecians and things like that, four gigatons. All animals combined, two gigatons. And viruses were 0 0.2 gigatons. Now, within the animals, the breakdown is also very interesting. Land um, arthropods, insects in other words, count for 0 0.2 gigatons of the two, so a tenth of the total are insects, whereas marine arthropods, like lobsters and shrimps, mm. are one gigaton, half the total. So it's probably krill, right, as would be my guess. Oh, interesting. Fish are 0.7 gigatons, so most of the biomass is, is terrestrial. Uh, livestock, this is domesticated animals, is 0.1 gigatons, whereas wild animals, non-domesticated livestock, is 0 0.007 gigatons. So and, they're they're and falling. So most of the animal biomass is cows and pigs and chickens. Oh, that doesn't surprise me. This is interesting. Humans are 0.06 uh, gigatons versus wild animals 0.007. So humans are 10 times more than all wild animals combined currently. Birds are insignificant at 0.002 gigatons. 
This is where the numbers get big again, relatively speaking. Annelids, which are earthworms and related species, 0.2 gigatons. Mollusks, which is like clams and lobsters and... No, uh, clams and... Um, scallops. Scallops and squids and octopuses. The, the delicious ones. 0.2 gigatons. Snedarians, which are jellyfish and corals, 0.1 gigatons. And nematodes, which are non-segmented worms, are 0.02 gigatons. So all of that is like to say some very complicated things, which I'll summarize, which is 90% of bacteria are terrestrial, but live underground. 90% of bacteria are living in the earth. 90% of bacteria are not in the oceans, even though oceans are 70% of the planet, but are on the ground, are on the land, but exist underground in oh. aquifers and under the seafloor um, and, and are why. very slow ma- metabolizing and take months to turn over. Insects have a lot of species, but contribute insignificantly to the total amount of biomass. Human biomass exceeds all terrestrial animals combined by tenfold, which was not always the case. Domesticated animals far su- and birds far surpass those in the wild. And cultivated plants are 10 gigatons out of the 450 gigatons. Um, and lastly, lastly, ocean biomass is a relatively small contribution to all of this, which I was so surprised by because I assumed that there would be so much stuff in the, so much life in the ocean. But it's only about 7 gigatons total of the, 400, of the 550 gigatons of mass on the planet. And of the ocean biomass, 6 out of those 7 are consumers of energy rather than producers of energy. Mm means that they are busily eating each other rather than making new energy mm. through photosynthesis. That's cool. That is so weird. So That's I can't, wacky. I don't know what a gigaton is. So all I can think of is a it gigabyte. Is, and so I'm picturing billion how much tons. space on my hard drive each one of these is going to take up. One gigaton on top of your hard drive would remove your hard drive. Got it. Got it. All right. Don, you want to go last or second to last? Uh, I'll go. I'll go second to last. All right. All right. Have you guys heard of the pitch drop experiment? <laughs> I'm going like to deviate away from like public health like and health all, all together. No, you don't know about this? No. The pitch drop? The pitch is this drop a baseball exp- thing? Are we going to go Yankees, no, Red no, Sox here? No. So this, this is the longest lasting experiment oh, in the history of the world. Oh. This is an experiment. This is the 60 which minutes was of experiments. started in... University of Queensland in Brisbane in 1927 by Professor Thomas Parnell, who wanted to demonstrate the fact that pitch, which appears to be a solid, is actually a liquid. This is pitch. that gooey star, tar stuff, correct? Right? Oh, pitch. Pitch. P I T C H. Correct. Correct. The, pitch. The, yeah. Is a. S- it's, it's, a it, it's a it's it really is a fluid, but it appears because it's so viscous, it appears to be a solid. So what he did was that he put a bunch of pitch into this glass container, and he um, opened the bottom of it, and he waited for the pitch to go through this glass container like a funnel, and for that drop to drop down. And he set this up, and this experiment has been going on since. ever since. And, and according to the ambient characteristics in his laboratory, a pitch drops once every 10 years. And uh, based on that, it has a, uh, where is it? Uh, it has a viscosity approximately 230 billion times that of water. But the real story wow. is that he spent awesome. his whole life yearning to see the pitch drop. <laughs> and apparently and he, was, he, he was never, then. well, it was before video. Yeah. It was never around to see the pitch drop. And then um, apparently in 1988, the seventh drop fell and he was there. But he had just stepped out, <laughs> oh, out no. of the room to get a cup of tea. My life's oh, work. No. He comes back, and the pitch drop had dropped. So then, <laughs> oh, no. then he and his team, fiercely anticipating the eighth pitch drop, ten years later, set up a webcam. Because now we're in the era of. Because well, we're now we in the era of webcams, it. and apparently that eighth pitch drop fell in November two thousand. And the day the pitch drop fell, there was an electrical storm. Oh, no. <laughs> and, the 
<laughs> and it was never recorded. Oh, and then he died. No. Oh. Wow. But then like the ninth bit drop my, dropped my in life. April 2014 and was caught on camera. And in fact, there is a pitch drop website which is which is visited by over two million people a year who can watch the pitch drop experiment I know live. What I know what I'm doing tonight. <sighs> so but, never sign up to be this guy's intern. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, wait, job, no, wait, no. Sit here, watch that thing. Do not leave your seat for a moment. Now that's not the only pitch drop experiment. Oh. There's another one. Oh, there's another one? There's another one right. at Aberystwyth University in Wales dating from 1914. So it actually precedes the Queensland pitch drop experiment um, by 13 years. But as the pitch is more viscous, this, this experiment has not yet <laughs> produced a, pitch a single drop. drop. <laughs> They're still waiting. How long has it been going? Since 1914. It has oh, yet wow. to. Yeah. And, and they're all sitting on the edge of their seat. <laughs> God, I love science. Any decade now. Any decade now, it's coming. <laughs> well, you know, we just got to know. Uh, I love <laughs> just it. Gotta That's know. fantastic. Love it. That's very cool. Wow. All right. Well, for mine, Do I they am... control for temperature? They, now, actually, what, ha- what happened was I, they had to recalculate everything because I think it was in, like, 2004, they air-conditioned the oh. building. Oh, that was a mistake. <laughs> Kill the so, experiment. Yeah, so apparently it's, it's all stretched out because it's more viscous. Oh, wow. <laughs> Not more viscous, it's just the temperature is lower. Yes. <laughs> all right, well, for mine, I went back to a familiar theme that I like to, to hit on, the quality of the journal peer review process. And so um, this one is a, it's from an, uh, an article, and I don't know how somehow I cut off the, the name of the journal where it was published, but this was a, an experiment done in uh, 20 or it was published in 2010 by Doug Peters and Stephen Cece. The title is Peer Review Practices of Psychological Journals: The Fate of Published Articles Submitted Again. <laughs> so what they did was they took 12 already published research articles by investigators from prestigious and highly productive American psychology departments. One article from each of 12 highly regarded and widely read American psychology journals with high rejection rates, so over 80%, and non-blind refereeing practices. They took these published papers and resubmitted them under fictitious names and institutions. To the same journal? I I think so. That's my understanding. I I mean, I'd have to go back and make for sure, but I think yes. So... The altered manuscripts were formally resubmitted to the oh yeah sorry to the journals they had originally they had originally refereed and published them they sent them out of a sample of thirty eight editors and reviewers only three were detected as resubmissions okay so the rest of them get through this um, allowed nine of the twelve articles to continue through to the peer review process and receive an evaluation of those eight of the nine were rejected. They were rejected, and 16 of 18 referees recommended against publication, and the editors concurred. The grounds for rejection were in many cases described as serious methodological flaws. Really? Wow. Yeah. What was the wow. time span between the original and the resubmission? So I don't – they, they said um, the journals that had originally refereed and published them 18 to 32 months earlier. Oh, wow. So recently. Yeah. Really? That so, recently? That's what wow. it says. Because wow. you, can, you can understand if it's 20 yeah, years yeah. ago. No, no, no. no. This doesn't so we're appear... not looking at like a, a, a shift and a sudden uptick in the quality of peer reviews. No, it's the capriciousness this of the system. This is just the random weirdness. I think of... what it gets to is, and this is the thing that just is, I mean, I don't know how you solve this, is, is exactly that, the randomness of the peer review process, that sometimes you get a great review, sometimes you get a terrible review. I would, I would suspect, to be honest with you, that you could – send me the same paper to review. And I would suspect there was something weird going on. Like I feel like I remember reviewing this before, but then I'd move on and probably review it again. And hopefully but, I would come up with the same thing. But maybe it went through a different editor. And no, a different no, I, think, set it, of I think it may have. I think it may have. But I'm saying, I think you could actually send me the same paper. And most mm-hmm. of the time I'd pick it up, but not always. Yeah. And I just, I think it, it speaks to a real 
problem with the peer review process and not mm. just for articles but for for grants as well i mean mm -hmm. i think there is absolutely a serious degree of 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 it's kind of it's kind of it's 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 like democracy the system sucks but it's the best well, we it's got the best one we have i do wonder um about the is there is there any ethical issues with, with submitting like what if it was accepted i would have been really pissed off well, if I was one, of the one, one was what a waste of my time yeah, yeah. i mean uh, you know anyway so I thought it was, I just thought it was an interesting take. Anyway, that one goes back to 2010. It was circulating on Twitter, which is where I saw it again. So that is the end of our program. If you've got any feedback on this or any other episodes, or you want to suggest a study or a topic for us to take on, you can tweet us at at PopHealthyX, or you can tweet me at at ProfMattFox, or Chris at ID.Gill, or Don at DThea1, or you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthyx.org. We would like to thank Leslie Talalian, Director of Lifelong Learning at BU School of Public Health, for supporting the podcast, and Nick Guler for sound and editing. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you download our next episode.